New Zealand had this reputation of being the most wild group of natives, as they called them, anywhere in the world. So it clearly was, from the people who came, some kind of deep conviction that they must respond to this call. The response of Māori to the first preaching of the gospel here in 1814, and that was the spontaneous haka. Ka nuku nuku, ka neke neke. Māori shifting and making space for the gospel to come into their lives, into their hearts. They surrounded the gospel with their own British worldview of thinking and practice, you see. So, um, in many ways, how the gospel is, uh, is uh, expressed and transmitted, that becomes the image of what it means to be a Christian. But actually, from a a totally gospel imperative, that's actually not what it looks like. Those are generally called colonial attitudes, and they're quite useful if you want to take over a place, right? It's quite good if you think you're better than the people you're taking over. It makes you feel good about taking them over. Uh, I don't think that was the main reason why people came here and why missionaries did what they did. I think it affects and impacts how they do what they do, but it wasn't the main reason. As they say, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. In the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, the early interaction between tangata whenua Māori and the European traders, missionaries and settlers is certainly somewhat of a mixed bag. Some would argue that as a direct result of this colonisation, there continues to be poor outcomes for Māori over 200 years later. But actually, is this the case? Our educational curriculum is now committed to telling the full story of the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. And honestly, this is great news. But I'm a little worried. How do we decide which version of this story to tell? Whose interpretation of the historical narrative gets carried forward? And is this going to be examined fairly and rigorously by learned academics? Or are we just going to perpetuate the myths and perspectives of those with a particular ideology or worldview? In this series, we'll look at some of the conclusions that people have come to about the motivations and actions of Christian missionaries in New Zealand's history. We'll be talking to experts, both Māori and Pākehā, and exploring the influence of Christianity on our nation, for better and for worse. In this episode, we'll look at the question of whether missionary involvement in New Zealand was part of an intentional colonialist agenda. The issue and impact of colonisation is complicated. And some people have got some very strong opinions on it. But honestly, I'm not even sure I understand the questions, let alone the answers. So let's start with some definitions. What exactly is colonisation and what causes it? Colonisation was predicated on some basic ideas, particularly this form of colonisation, which was called settlement, right? It's not just that people came and took over, it's they came, took over, and demographically swamped the locals. I think colonisation is a very specific form of colonialism. Colonialism is more generally the process of exerting power and influence over another territory and, and people. So in the New Zealand case, colonisation is the form that, that c colonialism takes. The gospel actually isn't a British idea, actually. It's not a colonial idea. It was actually a, an idea f that comes from the Middle East, actually. The, the king who's the king? Jesus Yeshua is the king who's actually a Jewish king. Uh, but the other definition is that uh, in the process of so doing, other peoples are subjugated or you know, treated unjustly. So that's, that's more the colonialism. It's quite 
common in the discourse now to conflate those two things, to you know identify Christianity with the colonial process. Uh, but in my mind, that's not, as I say, the original purpose of why the missionaries were here. If you're using the word colonization, yeah. which speaks to me about control, I would say that in essence, it's been devastating and continues to be devastating. Colonization, in my view, is an intentional process to make uh, or to create, to impose upon, uh, say, indigenous peoples, uh, the, the view of the British Empire. It's bringing another culture, uh, a dominant culture to New Zealand. Um, and uh, I guess it um, is to overshadow what was already here. Uh, in simple terms, that's, that's how, it, uh, how I see it. So I think we must always be wary um, about any idea that there is simply one abiding um, and unchanging nature of colonialism or colonisation in, in the New Zealand case. The impetus for the coming of the missionaries was to bring the word of God, uh, and but it always follows hard on the heels of either colonialism following it, yep. or it enters into a colonial world already. I mean, the gospel was birthed in um, a colonial a, a, a nation. Jesus was born in a Hebrew nation that was colonized by the Romans at the time. So they were in that, the gospel was birthed inside a colonial situation. And that's why it can speak to a colonial situation. Okay, so if that's colonization, I think we can agree that this is definitely something which happened as a part of New Zealand's history. But what or who caused colonization? Were the missionaries in favor of it? Was it always their plan to trick Maori into giving up their beliefs, customs and land so that they could be subjugated by the British Empire? I would say that the missionaries in many ways, they did stop customary practice, the missionaries did um, uh, you know, try to change us into a British way of thinking, into a more civilised, whatever that means, uh, world, world of practice and, and acting. Well, that isn't a gospel worldview of thinking. That's actually a, a world colonial worldview of thinking. Actually, we're guilty of that ourselves, even as Māori. We, we, we saw our enemies as other tribes in the same way, and so we colonised and conquered them as well. So uh, we're all guilty of that. I think it's pretty hard to read some of the journals and some of the writings over time that were written by people who uh, were followers of Jesus. And yet some of the things, they, they're kind of great when you read them now. We wouldn't say them today, right? So there's something very different about how people saw themselves and saw uh, the people of Aotearoa, the indigenous people here. Uh, but again, you know, people had uh, a, an intent to, to share this gospel message that was really, really important. And so, yes, the clothing sometimes was a little bit ill-fitting in some of the ways that people went about it. Uh, but everything, you know, it's all in the fruit that comes out of it, right? So where you see some beautiful fruit, where lives are changed, where something positive has happened, then you've got to track back to the source and see that there's some real goodness there. The missionaries uh, were actually opposed to open slather colonisation. They... Uh, particularly opposed to the New Zealand Company and its huge colonisation plans in the 1830s. So uh, the missionaries wanted um, Aotearoa's engagement with the empire to be measured and controlled primarily through their mediation. Well, the relationship between mission and empire is um, complex and it's shifting. So if we look in the New Zealand case, it is certainly true that Samuel Marsden who, you know, who is the architect of the New Zealand mission, working in close concert with a number of influential rangatira here in the north, that Marsden had a vision of missionary development that was informed by empire. He used the language of empire to talk about the mission. He talked about them, described the missionaries as settlers. Yeah. He talked about a missionary settlement. He even called it a colony. I think their first intent was to preach the gospel. They were evangelicals. Uh, so they were focused on conversion, they were focused on, you know, the cross of Christ, mm -hmm. they were focused on, um, you know, this religion of the heart uh, and on, on, I guess, spreading that word. 
and those missionary critics of colonisation were concerned about the way in which the earlier history of the British Empire exhibited two very important tendencies. One, that it caused significant harm through uh, warfare, disease and depopulation to indigenous and colonised communities. And secondly, that it was characterised by injustice, that um, what happened through empire was that colonised communities were impoverished at the um, same time as Brit British people or British merchant interests were enriched. Back at home, people like Danderson Coates, the secretary of the Church Missionary Society, or Beecham, the leader of the Wesleyan Missionary Society, uh, being very staunch critics of the idea that New Zealand might be a site for formal colonisation under the auspices of the New Zealand Company. I think that the uh, colonial world had another agenda, whereas the missionaries had a, an agenda to protect Māori and Indigenous people. And um, whereas uh, the systematic colonialism and exploitative trade and assimilationist law, that was a whole other machine that actually has nothing to do with the gospel, actually. The gospel message is actually about a more cosmic uh, salvation of humanity to walk in the middle of that um, realm. Well, the missionaries certainly made some mistakes along the way, and no doubt many of them had mixed motivations. But if a colonial agenda wasn't what was driving them, then whatever reason would they have to risk their lives on the other side of the world? Let's start by focusing in on the first missionary to New Zealand, the Reverend Samuel Marsden. Well, if you look back to uh, Samuel Marsden and, and his visit, the earlier visit, March 1814, then December 1814, uh, I, I would not say that it has anything to do with colonialism or colonisation because the purpose was the proclamation of the gospel. And it, it's, it's proclaimed in a way that it's, it's the message, not so much the, 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 um, the package that it comes in. The package is the colonisation, I suppose, but the message is still the gospel. Marsden was ambitious, no doubt. Uh, he was from he was from the lower rungs of society, you know, in Yorkshire, uh, far, farming sort of background, um, blacksmith, and and so. But he was spotted by um, some influential evangelicals who sent him to higher education, mm -hmm. as we'd call it, uh, at the at the old universities, and so he trained for the ministry. He then was basically. Uh, shoulder tapped by William Wilberforce and others from that sort of Clapham group saying we need a chaplain for this new penal colony in Australia. How about it? And he, he said, yep, I'm up for it. Uh, and he came, came over in, in, the, in the late you know, 1700s. Samuel Marsden clearly did feel that truly to integrate New Zealand into the British Empire and truly to raise the standards of Māori and convert them would make them part of a strong presence of Britain in the South Pacific, which was, after the Napoleonic Wars, pretty nervous about how it was surviving. Marsden was a, a, a very worldly person, mm -hmm. but com also committed to the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Um, so for him, I think uh, the process of improvement had very many dimensions that could operate in, an, in, if you like, an early industrial context, such as the Yorkshire he grew up in. It could certainly operate in an agricultural context, but it also could operate in a, in a spiritual context. The real focus so obviously was on the conversion of Māori. So that, and they stuck at it. Yeah during 20 years, remember, 20 terrible years of massive discouragement, of a, a tremendous sense of defeat. Um, why was nobody responding? Uh, one baptism I think they had to show for it after 15 years. There's certainly great differences in many of the missionaries' motivation in my mind to others that came to New Zealand for, I guess, for very selfish reasons. So they were looking for land, they were looking for new identities. And so in that way, they had an agenda that I can completely understand. Mm. But that agenda on that side of the equation 
ended up having, in some sense, unintended consequences for Te Ao Māori. So I, I think that the, the missionaries were really playing a part of carrying the gospel message to the ends of the earth. And Aotearoa just happened to be one of those places, like many other nation, nations, you know, that was been the purpose of the gospel, is to carry the message of the, the king, the Messiah king, to the nations. When you were there surrounded with Māori in a Māori world, a totally Māori world, in which the only way to survive, really, was to make yourself acceptable to the Māori community. And a lot of the things that went wrong began probably with an overzealous desire to make connections with Māori. And of course, a lot of Māori had, I mean, initial great desires to get some of the wealth which they perceived that yeah. or hoped that the missionaries had. Everybody has two motivations. It's a question of whether one motivation cancels out the other motivation. Yeah. And that's the issue that I always look at and think we have to give credit for the possibility of genuine and deep Christian conviction. And I think that's quite apparently there. A willingness to sacrifice home comforts, security, for the things that they believed in. Yeah. And that is essentially the goodness of Te Rongapai, the goodness of the gospel for all who would choose to hear it. The introduction of Christianity to New Zealand had a transformational impact on Māori. And regardless of whether or not the missionaries intended it, some of that impact had negative consequences for the Tangata Whenua. But was the impact all bad, or was much of it positive? And how did the missionaries respond to try and reduce the negative impact, or even push back against some of the consequences of colonisation? I think you just can't say it was all bad. I mean, I know my own chief when, uh, um, when they saw, you know, what was being offered by the, the colonialists, they were interested. Uh, um, you know, there's some bad, bad aspects to it, um, but let's not write it all off as bad. Uh, there's some, certainly some things that changed our society for the good. The invitation to come here to proclaim the gospel was, was paramount. Anything else, it happened to be uh, either English uh, persons who were proclaiming the gospel, but it's the message and not the messenger that was important. You know, Māori have experienced our history in a different way from from those that came to, to you know, resettle their lives. Displacement from lands, uh, the challenges to culture, uh, you know, to identity, to language, all of those things uh, have certainly impacted Māori people in, in significant ways. The missions were here to be missions, you know, to, to bring the Christian gospel. However, in so doing, and in, in sort of uh, introducing Māori to this new way, uh, and in a sense, to some extent, um, uh, Western sort of norms uh, that uh, it created the conditions for colonial settlement. But, but that wasn't the intent. It's interesting the Bay of Islands. You've got Pai here on one side and you've got Kororareka across the way and where the, where the sailors and the, and, the, and the whalers and such like were there. And Māori were trading with the missionaries uh, and they were trading with the, the whalers and they wanted muskets, uh, and the missionaries wouldn't trade with them. Yep. But also what was being offered was a different expression of Christianity. Uh, the whalers said, you don't need to keep the Sabbath and all those rules. You don't need to give up your way of life. Mm -hmm. The missionaries are saying, this is against God's law. Okay. Uh, this will bring the wrath of God on you. The missionaries had a hard time trying to convince Murray that actually we are your best friends. We have your best friends, even though you seem, even though it seems like we hate you. So Māori actually were able to see in close, there is what I would say is the, the results of European settlers, uh, and they could see the way of life being offered uh, by the missionaries. And you know, Māori were, they knew what was happening in Sydney, they knew what was happening in England. Uh, and there's actually a, a careful and an astute decision uh, uh, to, to pursue Christianity. I'm a descendant of those uh, first converts and those who were baptised. And uh, my view is that our people were able to flourish uh, within the setting of the gospel being proclaimed. Uh, that's important to me because uh, of the intention of 
uh, one, becoming Christians, identifying with Christ, but also ensuring that that is uh, in, passed on to every generation, including the generation to which I was born into. My ancestors built churches, uh, and those churches still stand today. What's important about that is the symbol of, of what they believed and what they wanted to, to ensure became the way of life for, for all of their descendants, uh, and, that, and that is true. I'm grateful for the partnership between Māori of the 19th century and before, along with our missionary folk who helped to translate the Bible into Te Reo Māori for my people to flourish uh, in faith, uh, namely that of Karaitiana Christianity. So uh, in terms of agenda, that is what I'm grateful for because I am a fruit of the decisions that some of our Māori tūpuna had made in terms of partnering alongside of missionaries who built mission schools to be able to teach my people, to lift them. Uh, there was a strong humanitarian um, ethos at the time, which arose partly through the anti-slavery movement uh, and once slavery had been abolished uh, through the British Empire in 1833, then sort of activists in the United Kingdom turned to the plight of Indigenous peoples around the world. Uh, they were significant advocates for, for holding back colonisation, um, holding back European settlement in, in new lands. Uh, but the reality was uh, that the population flows uh, were very hard to control. Um, missionaries and their uh, allies in London end up being the kind of the, one of the strongest voices against that. They publish, among other things, they, they, they coordinate and, and help um, help cohere a 600-page plus parliamentary report, a silly committee report that talks about um, uh, all of the challenges and evils that, that befall Indigenous peoples when this kind of thing occurs. Um, so they're, they're, they're very alert to it. They're very active in trying to prevent it. Um, and there is this deep sense that they are. Um, trying to do a very different kind of project in that period. You know, we'd had 20 years of tribal warfare at a level we'd never seen before in terms of, you know, the intrusion of muskets. Uh, and there were battles fought and people killed. Um, it was huge. And that we were looking for a way out of that. And the, I guess the Christian message um, delivered that. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, to say that we were colonised by the by Christianity um, is is not a true reflection of what happened. We went and, and you know, once they heard the gospel from our our people who came back from the north, we went in search of more. Perepi Taumata Akura, whose footsteps I uh, followed myself by going down to Tiki Tiki, uh, where he was the first to take the gospel uh, into the area where Ngāti Puro are, and that's my father's side. Yeah. And so he was uh, responsible in helping to stop cannibalism mm -hmm. between some of my tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was through the power of the gospel that he received and he knew was good for my people. So it looks like the missionaries didn't plan to colonise the Māori, and actually fought hard to reduce the negative impacts of it. Missionary contact with Māori may have preceded colonisation, but it certainly doesn't mean that it caused it. So what do we do with all of this? How should the church respond to the impact that colonisation had on Māori? Do we need to take some responsibility? And what role should the church play in restoration, biculturalism, or even decolonisation? As the Christian Church, we are accountable to Scripture, we are accountable to tradition, and we are accountable to revelation. And, and, and by, by saying that, it means our, how greater is our obligation to ensure that the Church leads out, ensures that there is justice, there is fairness for all. From a Māori perspective, is because uh, Māori have been diminished so much, then we have a, a greater responsibility to ensure that that is communicated in the right way. We have to recover the narratives that show um, that the purposes of why missionaries came, you know, the, the reasons why Māori made a decision, decision for Christianity uh, for themselves, that um, the fact that the church is in the, in the middle, in a sense, sort of mediating this relationship between the Crown and Māori means that we, 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 can't, we can't forget that, that role. If I think people understand the context, 
it's nothing, it's actually nothing to be afraid of. Secular society is not stable in itself without spiritual mana. And uh, so whether, whether the church, whether society wants to give the church a role, it has that role uh, because it, it holds the mana. Mm. And um, I think there's plenty of atheists who are today realizing, actually, even though I don't believe in Christianity, we need Christian values. <laughs> and New Zealand society, it's multi-religious and multicultural kind of environment. It still needs a source of spiritual mana. And I think the church uh, provides that. The church must recover its confidence that its gospel applies to politics as well as to matters of church. Um, regrettably, the whole story of the Western church is that the church retreats from matters of state, retreats to the safety and security of its own church buildings. I don't think that strategy can work any longer. I think as individuals, we have to come to understand what forgiveness means and on... Um, you know, both for, for Māori and non-Māori, we, we have to see that as the way forward. Uh, and, you know, at, at some point, um, you know, the whole story of if you, if you keep drinking the poison and thinking that the other person's going to die, uh, that's never going to happen. And, uh, you know, I've got to that point, you know, uh, I sit on the waiting tribunal and I hear um, the grievances that are brought by claimants, and it's um, the same all around the country, and it, it's... You know, a terrible history that 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 we have, um, and uh, you know, a settlement won't fix that. It'll go some way. Um, an apology won't fix it. It'll go some way. At the end of the day, we've got to realise that we're going to have to forgive, um, in order for us not to continue drinking that glass of poison. Uh, reconciliation is part of the role of the body of Christ, actually because we're called to be priests, to act in that way, in the middle of these things. So um, we reconciliation is something we're called to, actually. It's a ministry that we're all called to, everyone who's a Christian, um, whether it's between fathers and sons, husbands and wives, uh, different tribes, uh, nations against nations, you know, whatever. Uh, the, the, the Ministry of Reconciliation is actually for all of us to actually carry out, and the church should be totally involved in that. The role of the church is key to the decolonization process, um, to the, to the moulding of faith in modern contexts, which does not reflect the, um, the shall we say, the inappropriate attitudes of the 19th century that can sometimes be said to um, still live on. Um, the idea that civilization is um, is the thing to be aimed at mm -hmm. and that um, traditional values of indigenous peoples are wrong from the start. So the role of the modern church is in some ways to decolonization itself and its to decolonize itself and its attitudes mm -hmm. and also to guide its own people maori and pakeha and non-maori to um through that journey mm -hmm. and um you know i think we're on that path still lots to do while colonization may have been an unintended consequence of missionary activity the benefits and blessings of spiritual transformation were also clearly evident. In the next program, we explore the significant spiritual awakening that occurred amongst Māori in the 1830s. This was one of the most powerful and transformative revivals in the history of the church. And yet some secular historians doubt whether this wholesale conversion of Māori to Christianity was in fact genuine. So until next time, kā kite anō, mate wa.